Yeah. Oh, now it's going. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Welcome to the first <laughs> weekly sync for Collab Lab 12. Um, so I don't know how you guys want to get started with this. Um, You're our MC. So <laughs> take us away. Mentor planning meeting thing. Yeah. Sorry, it was a little slow this week. So the, the, just to review the odd week, this is an odd numbered week. This is week one, end of week one. So the odd numbered we weeks, we do, we, have a, we do demos like we do every week and we have a learning module. And then we do, we'll review the, the issues for the coming week. And then on even numbered weeks, so next week, we'll do demos. We'll do a retrospective where we look back over the last two weeks and see like what went well, what things could be improved. And then we'll review issues. So odd numbered week, so. Odd number week, there we go, sorry. Yeah. I was trying to pull up the web page on the mentor playbook little slow today. All right. Um, okay, so do do do, do learning modules. My bad. Actually, Andrew, keep going. Sorry, I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, that was wild. A person just appeared and handed you a, a glass of water. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so yeah, so We'll do demos first. So whoever, um, whichever pair wants to go first, but uh, yeah, typically a good format for that is to talk about what was the problem you were, you were assigned to solve and what were the acceptance criteria, have somebody share their screen and show, show the feature in action and then show the code and either that person or the other person can kind of narrate through the code and kind of um, talk through you know, anything you learned or um, wanted to share with the team. And then the other, like, every, well, have a little time after each demo for each person, each the other pair to maybe ask questions. So that it, just to make sure we all understand the state of the, the app before moving forward. So um, yeah, whoever wants to run it, do their first demo. Yeah, go for it. Gabby, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so all right, share my screen. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. All right, so our issue was to navigate between list view and add an item view, um, and then make it so that we could clearly tell which button was active at the time that it was clicked. Uh, acceptance criteria was having React Writer DOM added as a dependency. Uh, the links are present and persistent at the bottom of the app. Um, when one of the links is clicked, the browser URL updates to represent the current view. And whichever view was selected, the corresponding link should display in bold text. So we did that. <laughs> and so for us, this is what our finished buttons look like down here. And so we click list you'll see that it appears up at the top here and it's bolded and bigger. Then when we click add an item, that one enlarges and you'll see add an item up here. And uh, also see that the slug updates as well up there. Um, so I made all the criteria. Um, and EJ recommend we at first we didn't design them, but EJ recommended um, to just go ahead and do it. So we did that, and we'll figure we'll adjust them as we go and determine a theme or whatever for the mm -hmm. app. Um, what's next? Show the code. Yeah, yeah that's great. Okay. Um, all right, so here we created um, a React router and uh, just, you know, I guess it's basically just what the, a React router would look like with the React and the, or the router and the switch. And we have the path set to add item and list. And then they're linking to um, an add item component and a list component which we just, you know, made that the filler text that you saw up at the top there. Um, 
and then we separated it and made the nav bar its own component where we um, uh, first we made this just link and um, link it to the list and then this one was linked to add item but once we realized that we needed to do the uh, making it bold um, we realized that link wasn't going to work for that to so style them like with the active uh, class so we did discover um, nav link which allowed us to add an active class to it that we could use to bold it um, I believe that's everything anything else I missed that's cool. Where where does routes.jsx get included? Is that an app.js? That or? is an app, yes. Right okay. there. Sorry. All oh, right. Okay, cool. Nice. That's great. Yeah, that nav link is kind of like magic, you know? <laughs> You're just yeah, keeping track was... of what's selected, you know? Yeah. yeah something so simple, so powerful. Mm -hmm. And who is your partner this week? Uh, Terry. Oh, Terry. That's me. Anything that anything to add, Terry? Uh, I think Gabby covered everything pretty well. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the other pair? Have you all worked with React Router before? Familiar with it? A little bit. Uh, yes, <laughs> we were both familiar with it when we started it, so um, uh -huh. we already kind of had an idea where to go with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was the nav link kind of like a new discovery for you, a new implementation, or is that also like you've worked with uh, it before? It was, new, it was new for me, but Terry was aware of it. And so he was the one that recommended it. And we, and we were able to look it up real quick to see the syntax and everything of it. Yeah, cool. I've actually used it for my portfolio site, just uh, making sure the current page is uh, actively highlighted. I got the impression, because uh, we talked earlier this week, I really did get the impression that someone on this team had used it before and somebody else had Googled it. <laughs> like, I, like when they were explaining, I was like, yeah, one of you knew this and one of you learned it. Because the way that it, your code looked was just so, like it was just beautiful to me. I love that it came through on that. That was a really cool experience to see, like you to see that come through. Um, so team two, um, would you like to share, would you like to share your code? See, let's talk about your experience this week. Yes, we would. I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. Yeah. So our issue was. So as a component, um, we want to be able to read from and write to the Firestore database so that the users can persist information. Um, so we downloaded the different dependencies for Firebase and um, the React Firestore. Um, and then we um, made a change to the Firestore database and had it show up in the application and then made a change in the app and then had it show up in the Firestore database. So I can show you. Let's see. Oh. Me. Is it on Slack? Okay. So here's our counter, and here's the Firestore database. Um, if we click and increase the count, um, then you can see that it updated in the database. Um, and if I update the count in the database, then it should also update and I think I actually have to refresh it. Yeah, and then it shows up within the application. Um, so yeah, uh, did that and we can show you the code. Um, we added a counter.js um, and that was also included within um, or we added, added a counter component and then, uh, sorry, I can't find my app.js and added it right there. Um, and then we use the use effect um, and use 
state in order to add the counter in here. And then Alex, if you wanna jump in to talk more about the code. Um, yeah, sure. So one thing we also um, had noticed in the Firestore documentation was, um, Eden, if you can navigate to firebase.js, um, in the Firebase documentation, or in the Firestore documentation, um, there is always this um, function call for firebase.firestore. So um, we added that to be able to access the uh, Firestore database. And um, if Eden, you can navigate back to counter.js, um, we just added some error handling there that was um, suggested by the other team in the event that um, we couldn't access the database or if there was no um, uh, data that was able, yeah, I guess if we couldn't access the database to get or, um, or update the data. Yeah. So yeah, with the counter, we just added the new count and um, a get request. Um, and then we did an update um, uh, update request um, and use the function in order to update the count. And we had a few issues with new count. Um, I had to do a lot of um, research on how to get it um, to properly work and ended up adding this new count dependency here um, after we talked to EJ during office hours. Um, and I think that we're both kind of learning more about use effect as well um, and how to kind of pass uh, um, variables through that. Cool. So um, the, uh, let's see, one of the like really cool things about Firebase and Firestore is that it should be real time like both directions to the app. So um, the fact that you have to reload that, I think is because you're, you're just doing a straight get call and then, so it's only running the one time. But um, I see you're not using actual React Firestore, that, that component, like it was added as a dependency, but you're not actually using it here. That component will give you that, like it'll keep updating things. Um, if you use that component to uh, like create a provider or something, if you make a change in the database, it'll just flow right through the app and you won't have to refresh. So um, that's probably something that we should get in place um, this coming week when we, when we do the next set of issues is to use React Firestore uh, so that you have that kind of real time. You know, like one of the, one of the things that the app uh, you sh you'll be able to do later is once we ha we'll have a token associated with a, a, a list of shopping items, a shopping list of items or whatever you want to call it. And, You'll be able to share the token with somebody else. So, like, say you're, you know, you, you know, you and your partner or something at the store. Um, you're both looking at the same list. You know, it could be a different. Like, you go get this, and I'll go get this, and then like it'll just keep everything updated. You know, kind of in sync. So, um, it's pretty important to the functionality of it to um, to have that real time connection. So, uh, let's try to get that in place this coming week. Okay. But it's so fun. It's always so fun. Like you click the counter and it shows up over there like instantly. I just love that. <laughs> and this was the other, this, the cool thing about this one is I liked that. I believe you guys, you two had to teach yourself this completely from scratch, correct? Like it was something completely new. So I was really inspired by how, um, when we spoke over the week, they, they spoke about that. Um, and I actually used this to, look into teaching myself this. So I want to thank them for that because that was super cool. Nice work. And I love too that both both pairs were demoing on production on the production URL. That's like A plus work. Get that stuff in, in, in time to do that. Nice job. So next. Um, sorry to interrupt, Miles. I do have a question about that. Uh, Andrew, would that mean that um, Eden and I should work on updating this functionality this week as well on top of the um, new issue that we'll be working on? Well, the, um, you know, the thing that you made, the counter and everything is like, is mostly just to prove that we were able to make the connection to the database. So that work can all go away. So whenever we, like when the, in the next, in the upcoming issues, um, you know, we'll have uh, the ability to add an item 
So we'll just make sure that we uh, use React Firestore to implement that issue. Um, so, you know, whoever does that won't have that pattern to draw on, but they'll just need to kind of just kind of ramp up on React Firestore the component and and use it implement it that way. So it should be fine. I don't, um, and in office hours maybe this week we'll just make sure to kind of like we can you know if if people are getting stuck on that maybe we'll uh, just kind of help help them through that piece of it. Does okay, that sound good? Yeah, EJ, I saw your I saw EJ's uh, comment in the chat. Is that cool with you, EJ? I think you're on. Who's on office? Oh no, Jill's on office hours. Yeah, I just wanted to offer help because I should have been the one guiding them to do it. And I just did it the hard way when I did this myself because I didn't really think about the, the nice thing that the Firestore uh, component gives us. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what it's like. It really feels like magic. You're like, you update it. It's, it's like before you can even turn your head, it's already there. You know, it's just, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry about that, team. No worries. All right, cool. So. Next was wait even on learning modules. Mm -hmm. no. Yes, there's a learning module. There is. I'm trying to find this <laughs> the mentor playbook. I made the well, mistake of restarting a computer right before this, so all my windows are brand new. So in our in our mentor channel, there's a pinned a pinned post that has the schedule of what all the responsibilities are each week. So there this we week go. it's. Yeah, it's Jill doing the code review one. Yeah, let me see if I can uh, share my screen so that you can see the presentation. Here we go. Oops, not on the right. All right, cool. Is everyone seeing the code review tab? Mm -hmm. All right, yep. let me see if I can. Sorry, I'm just getting things configured on my end. Is it still presenting? No, yeah, we see the it? see Chrome now. Okay. Okay, cool. How about now? Yeah, that looks great. Okay. I'm just getting things configured on my end. All right. All right, so code reviews. Um, yeah, excited to talk about this now that you've had a little bit of experience yourself going through the process. But yeah, here's a little overview of what we're gonna be talking about. First, what is a code review? Um, then a little bit about the code review cycle, um, how to elevate your code reviews and make sure it's a really good experience. Um, how can you help others review your code? How can you review others code? And then finally, some tips and tricks that GitHub is available for you to be able to explore code a bit, um, a bit more effectively and make it work for you. So first of all, what is a code review? It's a conversation about a set of changes. And this word conversation is really a nice way to think about it because I think it's really common to hear the word review and you think about, you know, you're being graded, you're, it's something that you need to pass. But really a code review is just a way to talk about the code and get together because we're all on a team together and we wanna make a good product together. And the best way to do that is to really just talk about it and have a conversation. So that's just a really nice way to think about it. And so in a similar vein, it's a really good way to share knowledge and also um, learn from others about the code that they're using. Um, because you, know, you can learn from others about how they implement things because the code is right in front of you and it's a really good place to talk about it and learn about how things are going down. And you can also share things that you know that, um, uh, about the code that you worked on. And so uh, during a code review, you're collaborating and it's the space where you can share your work and you can ask questions. And um, yeah, you know, we are the collab lab. We really like collaborating. And so this is one of the really important parts about uh, just the things that you're bringing to a code review, you get to work on things together. And so 
during the code review process, uh, it helps you because it helps you improve as a developer, not only on the technical details and learning about how other people do things, but also it helps you learn how to communicate about the code and just understand the bigger picture of things and understand the code as a whole. And then it also really helps the team because you're decentralizing knowledge, which um, uh, a way to think about that is the knowledge isn't just central for one person. Everyone kind of knows a little bit of what, about what's going on. So that helps make the team stronger and less vulnerable to things like people being gone. Um, maybe people leave the team. Sometimes, unfortunately, that happens. Um, but yeah, it just makes things a lot stronger because everyone has a little bit of knowledge about all of the code. And so, you know, you think about how we did things this week. Two of you worked on Firestore, two of you worked on routing. But by reviewing each other's code, you got a little glimpse into what each other did. And so um, you're a little bit more comfortable and you're not just coming in blind if you end up having to work on something that maybe you haven't directly touched before. You at least understand it a little better. And then it also helps reshare, it, it also helps share responsibility. And by that, I'm saying like, it's not just one person's responsibility to make the code good and make sure that it's doing its job. It's really the team's responsibility. And that is really good because um, no one person is blamed when something goes wrong. And everyone who took the look really has some stake in it. And so that makes for, you know, like productive retrospectives. And if something went wrong, sometimes you'll see jobs will have like incident responses um, and it helps it create this like blameless environment where you can just move past mistakes and then come up with ways to do better. And so no one really like gets defensive defending their code. It's just the team's responsibility to make the code really good. And then it also just overall, it improves the code base quality um, because, you know, while you're, uh, while you're looking at it, everyone has their eyes on the code and has some say in what's going on. And, you know, like when, if two different different people have different ideas about how to implement something, you can maybe talk about it and reach a better solution together. And then on another hand, like while you're digging through the code, you might, uh, you might find other things that are wrong with the code. And it just gets everything that's going on with it out in the open and gets that knowledge out there. And so, yeah, what does the code review cycle look like? And yeah, this is also something you had some experience with this week, but really after a person or a pair develops on the feature, you'll open a pull request and then that makes the code available to receive feedback so other people can give feedback. You'll make changes based on that feedback and do that cycle until everyone's satisfied with the code and then merge it into the main branch. And then, you know, this can look a little different depending on what your team structure looks like. Um, yeah, we had the first set of approval by, um, by the other pair and then the mentors take a look at it. And sometimes you'll see like, sometimes there'll be some checks that you can put in GitHub to make sure that it passes tests. Um, sometimes you can see, you'll see like, there's like an audit checklist, just, um, it can look different depending on what, uh, what your team looks like, but the end result, you're merging code that uh, everyone approves of into the main branch. And so yeah, how can you make this code review a really great code review? So this first point, you really don't want to focus on just stylistic changes, you know, like, hey, you missed a semicolon, you, mean, you might want to add a space here. Um, these are all good things to point out, but there's actually um, there's tools that will do that for you because, you know, developers are programmers and they like to make things easy for themselves. So I don't think we have those integrated with this project specifically, but um, here are a couple examples like Prettier, ESLint. Um, these are things and even like uh, VS Code even has some like checkers in there for you while you're writing your code. But um, overall, like those are, those are the kind of things that are good to have, but um, when you're reviewing code, you wanna you know, focus on kind of like the bigger picture. You wanna focus on um, what your perspective as a developer of the whole code base can bring to it. So, you know, like, um, you know, you just wanna look at things that uh, improve the code as a whole. Um, let's see. 
You'll also, another good thing to do is to try out the feature locally or in a test environment. And um, so it can be really tempting when you're looking at the code to just look through the code in GitHub and say like, yes, this looks good. This meets all of our standards. But if you're only looking at it and you're not actually testing it out, you might actually miss a few things. You might see that it's not actually working or um, like, for example, a bug was pointed out with the counter where it uh, was flickering a little bit. And that's not something that was necessarily in the code itself, but by actually looking at it, um, it's something that you were able to um, pick out and see. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in another slide. Um, another nice thing to think about is, will you understand the code a month from now? And this is just a good question to ask yourself, both while you're reviewing the code, but also while you're developing it. Like, um, you know, like when you're developing the code, you're really entrenched what's in what's going on. And it's really easy to see like how the different pieces relate to one another. But a month from now, like, are you going to understand, for example, like what some variable means? Or like, are you going to be able to pick apart this really complicated nested for loop or something. Um, you know, just take a step back from the code and then think like, am I gonna remember, am I gonna remember what this means? Um, so you can, you know, add comments reminding you what a function does, things like that. But chances are you're, you are going to be coming back to the code maybe a month from now, maybe longer. So just put yourself in those shoes. And um, yeah, it'll be a better experience for everyone. Let's see. And then, yeah, praise. Praise is really, really important. And these next couple of ones are bold because this is just what makes the code review a really good experience. Um, and yeah, this reminded me of um, the statistic that I've heard where it takes five positive interactions to make up for one negative interaction. So that's, that's something to keep in mind when you, um, when you are looking at code because, you know, you're you work on your code, you put a lot of effort into it, but then think about like you get you get it back and then you see a lot of really bad comments on there like that can be really hard. So like in the future, you might be less likely to put yourself out there. You might be more defensive um, and just overall, it's really good to see the things that you're doing right in addition to things that uh, need improvement. So like, yeah, just as you're reviewing code, just be sure to point out some of the good things that you see. Um, and in line with that, um, default to approval. And this is kind of like a mindset to approach the code with. Um, instead of looking for things that are wrong, maybe look at it with a really open mind and try to figure out and ask yourself, like, what are they trying to do here? So even if something doesn't look like the choice that you would have made, it's, it's always good to like at least ask about what they were thinking and then have that conversation and you might reach a better understanding and might even learn things that you didn't know. So yeah, just think, hey, I'm sure they had a reason for doing this and approach it with that mindset. And then you'll also just try to be really kind and empathetic as you're reviewing the code. And this is really important because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all just people on a team together and we all wanna be able to work together. And the code review is, uh, it's like this one place where you're really interacting in that way together. So yeah, just be really kind and empathetic in the language that you use and in everything else. And it just makes it for, and it just makes it better for everyone involved. Oops. And then, um, yeah, you want to help others understand your changes. And we'll talk about this a bit more in the next section. But um, when you're writing up your pull request, it's, it's really important to help others understand what they're looking for. Um, so they're not just coming in blind and it takes some of that context switching away. And then also try to answer all the questions that other, that people who are reviewing your code try to go through. And if they ask questions about your code and they put the effort into reviewing it, it's just, a re it's really considerate and also, you know, keeps that conversation going. So just try to, you know, answer all the questions that they ask about it. And then um, that makes for, you know, just like a more complete code review. And then finally, just take your time looking at the code because yeah, a lot of development work is actually just reading code. Um, right here, we're uh, developing a new app, but you'll find you know, when you're uh, like digging into a new code base, for example, a majority of your time is really gonna be reading code. And um, 
yeah, most of your time will be spent trying to understand what others did. And then taking that time will really help you um, just become a better developer. So yeah, you think about the whole process, but writing, writing the code and creating the features is just one step in the whole thing. Um, but refining and improving the process is also very, very important. And it's all worth the time that you're gonna spend on it. So yeah. Um, when we, so yeah, when we talk about running the code locally, um, you'll wanna try it out locally first, uh, both when you're developing it, uh, developing it and also when you're reviewing the code. Um, because on one hand, it gives you confidence that your code is working and it does what it's supposed to do. Um, and then, yeah, like I said before, um, when you run the code, it might help you find things that you might not have seen if you just skim through the code itself. Um, yeah, don't be tempted to skip this step. Um, something you might see when you're looking at, when you see code reviews, this LGTM looks good to me. That's that's, it's nice, but it's also, it, you might miss some things that went down. So even if it does look good to you, you can point out things that looked good to you specifically. And then when you create the, uh, when you create the pull request, be sure to include instructions of how to run the code. Um, and I saw really good examples in both of your pull requests. So that's good, but it can, it can be really, really granular down to pull this branch, run this command to start uh, to pull the dependencies and stuff like that. And then as you're reviewing the code, if you don't know how to run it locally, just ask questions, especially here in Collab Lab. Like it's, um, we want to create that learning opportunity and get practice asking questions. And then, yeah, it's always an opportunity to learn a bit more. And so when you, when you write your code, how can you help others review it? You want to add a meaningful PR description to give context and give, um, give them more insight into what's going on. You wanna write uh, meaningful commit messages and that helps track the progress of what went down. Um, and it, it can make it easy to kind of pick apart what was added and when, and like maybe try to find out uh, where things might've gone wrong or something like that. Um, you can self-review your code. You can um, check your assumptions and then just try to figure out why you did what you did. Um, try to put yourself in the reviewer's shoes and then just try to understand what they might, might want to know because that might tell you some things that you might have missed. And then you can use some screen capturing tools, which we have, there's a few links here, but there's a lot, even just a screenshot. Um, and that can help, um, that can help just explain how things should work a bit better. Sometimes, um, you know, like when you're working remotely, you can have uh, when you're talking about the code, you'll have like this whole conversation that really could have just be, been condensed down to like an arrow on a screenshot. Um, and then I saw people had the before and after shots of what it should do. So it's just like one way to facilitate that whole process. So yeah, finally, some tips in for exploring your code in GitHub. And this is just a very, very basic primer, basically just to show you that there's a lot out there, but really the best way to um, best way to figure some of these out is just exploring github yourself so here's a little some examples that you can um that you can look through you can see the number of files that have changed um, you can navigate from file to file you can uh, piece through commits and then go through it in that granular way um, you can also uh, have check boxes to see which files that, have, that you viewed which can makes it which can make it a bit more digestible for you and yeah, um, there's, there's a lot out there. I saw, I saw some teams um, like using the, um, like the code line so you can pick out specific lines in code and write inline comments. I saw that one, that's a really good one. Um, so yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, that's, that's code reviews in a nutshell. Uh, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts about it. Um, yeah, how did, how did your code reviews go this week? Um, yeah, how did you think about code reviews or how are you gonna approach it next week and things like that? Kind of wanna open it, open it up to questions. Have people done them before? Have you ever, have you ever done a code review before you got to the lab lab? Let's see one no, two no's. <laughs> no? 
Terry, so you have some experience or you like it? Cause I, I wonder if like some boot camps, do you like, if they might be on a group project, you might do some code reviewing or something, but. Yeah. So, uh, in my boot camp during the last few weeks, we worked on a company project and on that company project, we were split into pairs and each pair sort of tackled their own issue. And the way we did code reviews was sort of similar to this, where uh, anytime we were ready to have something in a PR, we would go to another team and just ask for feedback. Mm -hmm. Then we sort of go back and forth from there. Were you using GitHub and doing it in GitHub or? Uh, yeah, mostly GitHub. Okay. Yeah. Something I think a lot of like new, like people who've become developers since GitHub existed, think that that's where code reviews happen. And it's one place that code reviews happen. But back in the stone age, when I started this stuff, there were literally sometimes a code review would be, get everybody in a room, somebody projects their code up on a screen and people sit there and pick it apart and provide feedback in real time, like in a meeting. So this, that's, that's another way to do code reviews that I don't know. I like to, I like GitHub as a tool for this because you have a conversation in place alongside the code. You can like reference to things. Um, you know, it's a, it's kind of a nice improvement over the bad old days. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. Did you review, did you do code reviews in pairs like in addition to developing the code? Did you look at it together? I guess it depended on how big of a change it was for like minor things, we could each uh, look at it on our own time and then leave some comments. But uh, there's a few bigger issues where we would actually have a Zoom meeting with the other team and then talk through it. Mm -hmm. And I found that uh, to be pretty helpful when it comes to finding out the problems. Yeah, it actually can be helpful. I was kind of, I was probably being too hard on the way we used to do things, but um, that's where like these, the Loom videos, uh, you know, kind of a, like a screen share or something can be nice because it might take you, you know, a thousand words to describe something or it could take 30 seconds of just talking through it and pointing at stuff, right? Um, this week, did, did either of the pairs, like, like Jill was asking, review the other code as the pair? Did you pair program on the review itself? Oh, you did, cool. Yeah, me and Gabby actually, uh, did the review together. Nice. Yes. Yeah, same with um, Eden and I. It felt wrong not to do it together, for uh -huh. me anyway. So um, we made time to look through it together. That's great. That's cool. Yeah. It makes you want to go back to I every other team that we've ever it, had. Especially yeah. now, like just getting practice talking about it. It makes you want to go back to every other team and ask them if they, that's how they did it. Because it just makes a lot of sense when you say it that way, Alex. You know, you're paraphrasing like, on, the, on the code, so. I feel like my, my cohort, we, like, we usually did, like it was something that we made time to do. Uh -huh. Even when things got super chaotic, I remember being like, yes, hang on, I do have to like sort out my chaos for five seconds just to get this in. But also Zappy seems like an awesome thing. I downloaded that from your, I was downloading mm -hmm. it in the corner. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, am I still sharing my screen? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I can close that. But here are some, here's just some like other uh, resources on code reviews that, and I'll post this in the channel afterwards so you can dig into those yourself. Yeah. Nice, nice job, Jill. Yay. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for screenshotting that because I was like finger trying to screenshot at the same time. <laughs> cool, cool. Why do I keep losing the mentor screen? Like I can't find it today. Um, so next up is, I think that's about it because it's been about an hour. Well, we need to go over the issues for the coming week. Oh yeah, issues for the coming week, my bad.
I just, I'm not with it today. It's been a long week. So it's and that's actually me. So I'll, I can yeah. share my screen. Um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, y'all can get to the project board. I'll post it back, that back in the team channel. So um, project board. And so um, I think, let's see, we have, it's like Gab Gabby and Alex are, to get, are pairing this, this week and Eden and Terry. So we have two issues as we always do because there are two pairs, so that makes sense. Um, the first issue is as a user, I want to set up a new shopping list so that I can start tracking purchased items. Pretty core functionality to the app. Um, a shopping list consists of a set of items associated with the user's token. So, um, I can see you better now. All right, so when we create a list, what that, what that consists of is sort of this following sequence of things. So we generate a new unique token. We save the token to local storage, and then we just show the user the list view. So this, this issue is really about, uh, it's about generating a token, saving it to local storage. There's another issue that, the other issue that's gonna be worked on this week is associating that token with the actual list. So um, these are kind of two sides of the same, same coin this week. Uh, so yeah, you generate a token, you save it to local storage, and then you send the user back to the list view, whatever that is. So there's a script in, in the repo under source lib uh, is tokens.js that you can use. You can actually just import that and use that to generate a token at the point where you need to do that. And tokens are just sort of three random words put together. Um, there's nothing really very fancy or, or super secure about it, but uh, it's pretty low stakes uh, thing. So, um, so the acceptance criteria. So for a user who does not already have a token or a list, um, which means they don't have a token saved in local storage. A button or link should exist on the home screen that allows them to create a new list. Um, so clicking on the button or link generates a new token and saves it to local storage. And then once the token has been created and saved, the user is redirected back to the list view. So that's, that's this issue. I'll go over, go over the next one and then we can figure out which pair is gonna take which one. So the other one is issue four. And issue four is as a user, I want to add a new item to my shopping list so that I can start recording purchases. Also pretty core cool functionality. So a shopping list item contain, consists of the following data points. So the name of the item, how soon you're likely to buy it again, and then the last purchase date. So the how soon you're likely to buy it again, uh, we kind of, by default, we have sort of three values that the user can choose from. Soon, kind of soon, not soon. And that corresponds to the next seven days, the next 14 days, and the next 30 days. So, so, that's, that's an, so an item has this basically this shape. So name, how soon, and last purchase date. So the acceptance criteria. So the user is presented with a form that EJ reminds us to make semantic. Um, to enter the name of the item and then to select how soon the person anticipates needing to buy it again. Soon, kind of soon, not soon. Uh, when the user submits the form, the item is saved to the database associated with the user's token. So you may, you may notice the race condition between these two issues. We don't have a token yet. So if you're working on, on, this, on this issue, you're kind of waiting for the other team to get the stuff in place to have a token available. So what you should probably do with this is just uh, hard code a token um, in the short term. And then when we go to merge, just have the token read from local storage and, uh, or you could actually just put, you can manually, you don't know how to do that. Here, I'll show you how to manually put a, a token into local storage. So if you go into your, well, nobody uses Safari but me, but um, the, the equivalent stuff exists in, in Safari or in Chrome, I mean, you can literally just go into um, in here and say, you know, like token and uh, sorry, okay, should be able to add a new one token. Okay, there we go. Um, just make up a token, and then you could use that as your token for the purposes of the um, of the of building the issue. So that way. 
when we hook it up and like you, you merge, there'll be a token in local storage. We'll use that token instead of the one that you hard coded into, uh, into the browser. So, um, okay, so that's associated with user's token. And then along with the item name, you want to save an integer corresponding to the estimated number of days until the next purchase. So seven for soon, 14 for kind of soon, and 30 for not soon. The last purchase date should be set to null initially. So what that conceptually means is that you can, you can add an item to the list without ever having purchased it. So the first purchase will actually come later. We'll have an issue later where you can, you can mash a button and um, it'll be set to purchase on a certain date. But when you first save the item, you can set that field to null. Um, uh, it'll be a, it should be a date field, but uh, we'll set it to null initially. Um, and then this is a little bit of sort of implied work with this, but you want those item, the item names, just the names is fine for this, this week. But the item names should then, once it's added, should display as a simple sort of unordered list on the list view. So you go to the add form, you, you add something. If you go back to the list view, it should show up there uh, just in a simple list. Um, so those being the two issues, are there any questions, first of all, about either of these? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if the user doesn't have a token and they navigate to the add item or list view, should it just redirect them to the home page then? Yeah, I guess if you, you know, if you come into the app, um, like the, the idea is like, if you come into the app and you have a token, it should take you straight to the list. If you come into the app and there's no token, you should, you should be on sort of a home screen that has a basically just a button to, that you can mash to create a token. Does that make sense? So I guess if you manually navigated to add item or something, and you didn't have a token, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know what, what people think, but we could, just not worry about that right now. <laughs> Maybe defer that if we wanted to kind of tidy up the app later. Um, it's a little bit of an edge case maybe, but it's a, it's a good call out, but won't necessarily have to handle that, I don't think. Unless anybody has a strong opinion otherwise. And then Gabby, you had a question? Uh, yes, yeah. so for the, um, the soon, kind of soon, not soon part. Yeah. Uh, should that be displaying on the front end at all, or is that just something for the back end to know about? Yeah. So. Like, um, yeah. Good question. We actually have. Whoops. That's not what I meant to open. We have wireframes that kind of show um, what the screen should look like. So. This is, you know, it's kind of particularly helpful for this, this issue. Um, so yeah, so the idea is that, and so this is sort of the most bare bones possible implementation that you could do, right? Like there's no styling. You might actually, what you're asking about is like, we have soon, kind of soon and not soon here as a, a group of radio buttons. What you could do is say soon and maybe in parentheses within the next seven days or something like that, just to make it more explicit to the user what they're selecting. Um, you know, kind of soon you could put in parentheses in the next 14 days, that kind of thing. Is that what you're asking? Okay, I th think so. Okay, so like they'll put in eggs and then they'll select soon, kind of soon or not soon. Uh -huh. It add an item and then a list item will pop up just saying eggs, but not like seven days or anything. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, when they go back to the list, yeah, it should, right for now, for this, this week, it should just have the name of the item. Um, implementing more, more functionality around the list itself is, will come in a later, a later issue. Okay. Yep, yep, good question. So this, this also, this wireframe goes through a few sort of accessibility things, a few little tips. So um, you should have a label, a label uh, element around your, um, like the, around the field so that, a screen reader picks up the fact that that label is associated with that particular form field. Um, same with the, uh, with the radio buttons here. Um, grouping the radio buttons with a field set element 
you're not familiar with that, it's uh, just you know look at look it up. It's a it's a it's a standard form element, a semantic element that will creates a group of um, a grouping of uh, form elements. So, um, and then a usability thing is that you want to select one of these time frames by default. So a user you know should be able to just come come in, put in their name, hit add item, and it should give them a, you know a kind of a smart default for uh, for that. So maybe as a team, you could decide which one of these makes the most sense, you think, from your perspective. And then the last thing, I've seen this happen a couple times where you hit the add item button you're, and nothing happens and you're kind of wondering, did it work? So it's nice to give a little bit of feedback to the user, an alert or something that just says item added um, you know, after they click the button. Um, and it's after they click the button and the call is successful. <laughs> if the call was not successful, they learn it like they're on a flaky network or something, it would actually be good to give, this isn't part of the AC, but a, like a stretch goal would be to give some feedback that, it's, that it didn't succeed, right? Um, but assuming it succeeded, give a little bit of feedback to the user that yeah, the call went through, your item was added. Um, so there's a bit of functionality there. There might be some things that are new to people, like field set elements and some of that kind of stuff. Um, but it's a pretty core thing to the app, so kind of fun to work on. I don't know why I'm trying to sell you on it. <laughs> you have to do one or the other. But, um, it's a, either pair have a preference for which one you take. Gabby and Alex, do you have one that you want to do? Um, I don't have a preference, but Gabby, if there's one that you want to do, I'm fine with that. Do not have a reference. Either one. <laughs> All right. Am I going to have to flip a coin? Is there a, uh, anybody feel strongly about it? Terry or, um, or Eden, do you feel strongly about it? All right. Yeah. Cool. I saw, I saw you on, on mute. <laughs> no preference. Okay. Yeah, right. no preference. I'm open to both. Okay. Yeah. So what I'll do is whoever's first, so Gabby and Alex will take three because um, it's first and then Eden and Terry can take four. Um, so would you all mind assigning yourselves to these cards and moving them into in progress? And then um, how, did, how did it go with like setting up branches and everything last week? Are people comfortable enough with that to do that in your first pairing session? Is that all right? Yeah? OK, cool. Um, all right. Well, let us, this is like things start to get a little bit real here. So. Um, definitely hit us up with questions if you start to implement it and then you're like, oh, wait, I, that seemed like it made sense at the time, but now I don't know what that means or I don't know, I don't know what the interface is to this script that's provided or, you know, any of those kinds of things. Just hit us up in Slack and let us know. Um, otherwise, have fun with the issues this week. I think you're going to do great. I have one more question. Yeah, yeah. Um, at what point should we should we ever start worrying about um, the styles of anything yet, or are we or just focusing on functionality and focus on that later? Or yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, it's we'll we'll have time. We have time to sort of set aside at the end of the project to add polish and kind of style things up. So you'll have almost two full weeks to do that. So um, yeah, I would I would just do the minimum you, you can kind of get away with now. Uh, so you don't kind of go to, you know, don't spend too much time on implementing that because we will dedicate time to it later. Um, that said, like things, things like, you know, like um, some of these suggestions of like, you know, labels and field sets and some of that stuff, uh, that's gonna imply some styling maybe, but it's, those things are pretty core to making the app accessible. So definitely pay attention to that semantic HTML. And that'll leave you all the levers and stuff you need later to style things the way you want. Okay. Good questions. Cool. All right. Cool, cool. With that, I guess we're going to call this a day. Lovely um, to see. Oh, one last thing. I guess who who's doing? Jill, you're doing office hours this week, right? Yeah, I think it's me this week. Do you want to so. just try to schedule that while we have everybody on the call? Yeah, maybe that'll be easiest. Um, okay. Yeah, does everyone, what time do we do last week? Like, is there a time that works for everyone or how do we want to schedule that? 
Um, after 5 p.m. Eastern time is best for me. Okay, cool. Um, I, I'm i busy Wednesday evening, um, so I won't be able to do it Wednesday evening, but maybe Thursday, if that sounds okay. And of course, you can you know ask questions and we can do things on the fly too, but I, I'll make myself available maybe Thursday, uh, 5 o'clock Pacific time. Does that sound okay? Is that too late for the East Coasters? Eight o'clock your time? No? No, I've got to think about that too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I was trying to schedule TCL 15's office hours and I'm on the U.S. West Coast and we have somebody as far east as uh, the country of Georgia. So he's uh, 10 hours ahead or something. So we ended up with 8 a.m. my time. For on Wednesday for office hours. <laughs> it's worth it though. It's fine. Nothing better to wake you up than office yeah, hours. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll make myself available then, but as always, and I think EJ mentioned like maybe setting up Firestore a little bit earlier if, um, if you want to take care of that too. So cool. Thanks for the thumbs up, EJ. <laughs> yeah. Nice job this week. Well done, everybody. I think you're off to a great start. All right, cool, cool. So with that, I guess we will call it a call it a wrap. And I will see. I'm gonna end all. Um, stop the recording.